This video is brought to you by Squarespace, the best place to create a website on the internet. I have a Canon R6, and I think this is the most exciting camera to have come out in a while. I know everybody's hyped about the R5, and for good reason, but honestly, this is the camera that I think most people would be buying, photographers and filmmakers alike. I think most people are very confused about what this camera is. Even Canon is positioning it as a replacement for the 6D. That's not what this is at all. Canon basically brought over the processor, autofocus, and sensor from the 1DX series, which is their flagship professional cameras, and put in this smaller mid-priced camera. Yeah, there are a lot of reasons to be excited about the R5, but for a lot of people, this is their next camera. Let's go find out why. For photographers, I know a lot of people have got hung up on the fact that this is a 20 megapixel sensor. That may not seem like a big number when the R5 was just announced and it's 45 megapixels. Yeah, okay, less than half, I get it, that seems small. Canon clearly took this sensor off the top shelf. It's got the incredible colors that you've come to expect and is already loved by professionals everywhere. Really, nobody could complain about this image quality. Let's do a little test. Let's try to spot the difference between the 20 megapixels of the R6 and the 30 megapixels of the EOS R. Okay, Anya needs no introduction. She's my photography <laughs> partner, business partner, all kinds of partners. So we shoot together all the time. Her opinion counts for a lot. And Jason Ang is a- For a lot, but not all. <laughs> well, we're gonna give Jason a little bit of a chance here. Uh, he is a professional photographer. How many megapixels is your camera currently? 42. We're gonna be comparing two photos here. One is shot on a 30 megapixel camera, <laughs> one on 20 megapixels, but then they've been resized to be the same final size. And you're trying to figure out which one is the original bigger camera. Okay. okay. So Great yeah. shot. Look at the sky that day. Beautiful. It's, okay. And right now, oh, I, it's actually hard to tell. Right now, I don't actually know. Which one would you feel comfortable blowing up to a bigger print? Oh, that's it. Maybe this is a good indicator. <sighs> this is bigger. Yeah, I, I think that this one's bigger. This one seems sharper. Yeah, I concur. And that's based off of this. Final answer? Sign. Oh, one sec. Yeah, I think I think overall the other one is sharper. Okay, so yeah, we got we got another one here. This one's sharper. Yeah, that one's sharper. That was fast. Yeah. Yeah, that one. It's clearly sharper. Not that. No. This. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right, now this is the best photo of all. <laughs> Wait, you guys didn't even zoom into the last one. You don't need to. It's so weird, like, you're talking to us, but you're on the <laughs> screen. Yeah, the same I don't room. know what's happening right now. Mm. First one. I mean, you at least got to gotta zoom in. <laughs> I'm trying to stare at one spot. Move it. That one. It's sharper. These are pretty, these are pretty close. I'm looking at his beard hair. Yeah, me too, but I feel, you know, no, I'm going with this one. Oh, wait, look, so you, okay, guys look, have, you have opposite look, choices? Are we seeing just depth of field though? I mean, like, I hate yeah. to complicate it, but like, is the sharpest point the same sharpness? Because if it's falling off differently, that's just because like my angle of my head could be slightly different. It's okay, gotta look be based at the on bags under his eyes. That one seems sharper. And I mean, I do think the focus is on my eye. Like, I think these hairs are the most in focus, like the reliably, the reliably. Okay, 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 okay. I can get on board with that. And your eyelashes, that one. Yeah, so, yeah, 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 yeah. This is the, this is the one. Based on the uh, circles. Your the eyelashes. <laughs> yes. Your bottom eyelashes are sharper. In I this look one. like the most tired in it. Okay, let's winner it. All right, so let's see what happened. This was our, this was our winner on the first. This is shot on the R. So this is the 30 megapixel camera. This was shot on the 20 megapixel camera. So this was your like instant reaction yeah. was this one. And this is the smaller file. And here, uh, again, you chose the R. This is the 30 megapixel file. So you chose the bigger one. You chose the bigger one twice, twice. and the small one once. But so, they're so close. But I have a question now based on that. Does the smaller file process out differently? I mean, is there any in-camera sharpening in the sensor? All of the settings are exactly the same between the two cameras. So I went through all of them and dialed them in. And they're both JPEGs as well. They're not RAW files. But does it even matter if this is like, <laughs> if you're looking at them 100%? I'd also say, this, so this one you guys were saying was really close. But I, I would say once you zoom into 400%, you can see it. This isn't as sharp. This sharp. is yeah. sharper. And yeah. this is the bigger file. So yeah. the difference exists. Is this like a billboard size, would you say? I would be comfortable printing either of these on most billboards. 
Billboard is a myth because yeah, viewing distance is like 12 dpi. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, obviously. Yeah. So again, this one you instantly chose this image. I'd say up close. This is and, sharper. Yeah. yeah, so that's the bigger file. So again, yeah. when we're at 400%. But not, a, so, not by a lot. Like, yeah, it's not crazy. Yeah. So small. Yeah, here, I mean, it's using the default resizing algorithm from Photoshop. And you can get better ones. Like there's more expensive resizing software, but you can see there's a little bit of like haloing and yeah. sharpening going on. But you see Is this how... exercise supposed to convince me that we need this big, bigger megapixel? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is all to talk you into the R5. Yeah, but here, let's go back down to full size and just look at that again. Yeah, this is the one we chose, right? Mm -hmm. And it's weird how it has that effect of being sharper and I can yeah. still, I would still choose it again. Yeah. I don't know if it's the trees or how it processes or... <laughs> well, thanks for playing, guys. Yeah. Oh, Everyone's a winner. This was the funnest game I've ever played. <laughs> Let's take a closer look at this camera. Here we've got the R6 and the EOS R. By the way, I'm really glad we can stop saying EOS R, like this isn't the EOS R6. It's just a waste of letters. Can we just call this the R and the R6? The R5 and the R look a lot more similar. They both have this dial screen. Let's get it turned on and see what it looks like. Where you can see your settings in a little thing. Over here, that is something that's lost. I wish these were still combined. Basically, like they were on the 5D, that was a solved problem. One thing I didn't actually expect is there's less grip on the R6 because the R is just a thinner camera. The R6 is a little bit fatter, so it means that your fingers don't go as deep into it. That's fine, like this is kind of like the 5D, it's gonna work great, but I really appreciate adding this little notch to the power dial. If we look at the R, it was just completely round and a little easier to miss. I think we can all agree the worst crime of the R was this little slide dial, which nobody, including me, ever used. Now we've got the proper joystick, just like every other Canon. I just noticed, is the R screen slightly bigger than the R6 screen? I think it is. Do you have a portfolio for your photo or video work? If not, or if so, I've got a sponsor for you. Today's video is brought to you by Squarespace. Whether you're a photographer or filmmaker, their responsive templates make it really easy to make a super professional, modern looking website that hosts all of your creative work. Are you a filmmaker? Great, you can have full page videos playing in the background as soon as anybody lands on your site. What's that? You're a photographer? Even better, it's super easy to make galleries that show off your work at high resolution, barely any compression, and you don't have to worry about the compression either. Just upload large, full-size photos and Squarespace will handle all the rest. Their all-in-one tools make it easy for your work to look beautiful. It has the photos and videos standing out in front with their responsive, mobile-friendly templates. So no more delaying. Go build that portfolio right now by going to squarespace.com to start your free trial. You'll have a fully functioning website up in minutes, and then when you're ready to launch it, you go to squarespace.com slash Tyler Stallman to save 10% off the first purchase of a website or domain using offer code Tyler Stallman. A few people on Twitter, including Renault, asked, I'm really curious to see the responsiveness of the camera. It was the main reason I could not use the ESR. To shut down, I noticed the R is a little bit slower. Let's boot them up. Let's try again. A little bit faster on the R6. Ever since we moved from DSLRs to mirrorless, one thing we kind of gave up is really snappy, responsive menus. Like when you make a change, you're kind of waiting for it. And that drives me crazy. It was especially bad in my Sony and the a7S III and the a7R III that I shot with. Both of them, I just felt like I was waiting on menus all the time. It can be hard to judge, hard to notice, because it's really just microseconds and how your camera changes after you hit the button, but it should feel instant. You should have this tactile relationship so that you know if you make a change, it happens. Anyway, that does feel better in the R6. I didn't notice any slowness at all today. It just didn't bother me throughout the day, and I do feel it in the R. There's little menu glitches, little things that just take so much longer to shoot with the R. The R6 really speeds up your work. I've seen a bunch of concerns that this only records in IPB and doesn't have all I. If you don't know what those are, they're two different types of compression. Basically, all I is that every frame is compressed in the same way, and IPB compresses frames in between more. So, in theory, you should see some amount of motion artifacting with IPB. A lot of the information about these codecs is kind of dated. I couldn't find any really accurate examples that actually show what happens between these two. And then I asked on Twitter, I said, can anybody show me an example of this happening? And I didn't find any, so I decided to shoot my own. Looking at these, I just don't see a significant difference. I did have Armando suggest that maybe the IPB is recording in a lower bitrate, but that doesn't actually sound likely to me because I feel like 
Canon would have mentioned it. I get the impression that these are both recording at the same bitrate, but that the compression method is just so effective that you get way smaller files with IBP, and there isn't really a big visual difference. So personally, I'm not gonna worry about it. We're recording an IPB right now on the EOS R, and I find it looks completely fine. The biggest differences will be the 10 bit, which is a much larger advantage than worrying about your motion compression. The files out of this still look a lot better. A lot of people asked about dynamic range. Now, when it comes to stills, this is gonna be just like the 1DX, like I said, same sensor. But so far, I can't test it properly because I can't open the raw file, so we're just shooting JPEG today. And in terms of video dynamic range, they're probably gonna be about the same because they're both using the original catalog, and that is a limitation of how much dynamic range can be captured by it, even though this is 10-bit, whereas this is 8. There are rumors that I really hope are true that there will be a C-Log 3 firmware update for the R6, and that would mean that it could have more dynamic range and the 10-bit would be able to use it. So all of a sudden, this could really start competing with the cinema cameras a little bit more. The fact that it's confined to just regular C-Log does mean that you know the C200, C500, C300, they are all gonna still look quite a bit better than either the R6 or the R5. Even if you're shooting 8K RAW, which that image is gonna look amazing, it, it will be useful for a lot of people. Don't think of it as the best possible image quality out there because on other cameras that are only 4K, like the C200 that I'm shooting this on right now, it has access to C-Log2, which has the absolute most dynamic range out of any of the Canon log profiles. And by choosing C-Log, Canon has effectively put a cap on how much dynamic range can be seen in video mode. Another thing to remember, the only way that you're getting the 10-bit recordings is by recording in log. If you use any of the regular Rec. 709 full contrast profiles, they are recording in 8-bit. Time to test the slow motion on this thing. It can shoot 120 frames per second. Johnny, you're gonna test it for me. Don't be surprised if the 120 frames per second is a little bit softer, noticeably softer. It is only available in HD, but it's still soft for HD. Like it's softer than if you just record in the regular 1080. I'd like to see if the R5 is sharper than that. That is one of the things that it is a real advantage on the R5 and something I'd actually use all the time. 4K 120 is amazing. Let's see what this image stabilization will be like for vloggers. So this is on the 16 to 35 millimeter EF, meaning there is no lens stabilization. It is sensor only. And now I've turned on the basic digital stabilization. There's a slight crop here. Should be a little smoother though. And this is on the EOS R at 16 millimeters, so there's no stabilization at all. All right, ultra wide, not that impressive, but the IBIS gets amazing as soon as you zoom in a little bit. So this is at 70 millimeters. I'm hand holding the camera and it feels pretty rock solid using only the sensor stabilization. This lens has no stabilization. It is an EF mount and it looks great. I love this. I don't know how I'm gonna go back to using the cameras that don't have the stabilized sensor. Now, overheating, this is one of the biggest concerns that everybody has talked about a lot. And you know what? It is real, also on the R6. It's not just an R5 issue. And you can actually see it right now. Just by having the camera on, you can see that there is now a 10 minute record limit in 4K. Canon had mentioned that you can record up to 30 minutes in 4K24, so I was surprised to see this limit. But this is just because the sensor is getting warmer because I'm using the camera and it's really hot in my studio. <laughs> So be aware that if the ambient temperature goes up, you will have some restrictions on what you can do with this. When we were outside today, it was never too hot. I could always record the full 30 minutes, but you're gonna have to be aware of it and keep an eye on it. You can't just keep shooting in 4K all day long or your camera's gonna shut down and then you're stuck waiting for it to cool down. I'm gonna have to spend more time with it before I know what the repercussions of this on my shooting style, but you've gotta know about it going in, especially if you're shooting something like weddings, events, and you keep it on in 4K or <laughs> the 8K on the R5, you might have some problems. You're gonna need a backup body nearby. Hey, I'm just about to release the video and I had a few more thoughts about overheating because I did run into it a few times and I've heard other people reporting issues with it as well. So it is definitely a real thing when you're recording in 4K. This happened in 60 and 24 frames per second for me. Never happens in 1080, just so you know. Don't have to worry about that. And it actually didn't overheat while we were recording it all. What happened was at the end of the day in our apartment as the temperature went up, it seemed to just be a little too hot to record. So I don't know, in a few weeks, I think we'll figure out exactly how much of a problem this is and how to avoid it. But right now, as of releasing the video, all we know is it's some kind of problem. So just be aware of it. If you wanna hear a lot more details about it, you should go subscribe to the podcast at stallmanpodcast.com. I can't stop talking about these cameras, so they're gonna be featured on it a lot, but we go way more in depth with other YouTubers, creators, photographers about how they create the work that they do. 
Thanks so much for watching, guys, and we'll see you in the next video.